do um, and, and sort of got inspired by um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in those sort of days. This, this Temple, did you make notes there, bro? Pardon? Yeah, he's looking at notes. Uh, I saw that. No, no. Have you got no, notes? <laughs> <laughs> no notes? No notes, checking, please. <laughs> but, uh, I was like, this guy's analyzing. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, let's get it going. If you don't know now, you know I am Gobani Bobo. And with all this time that we have and on the lockdown and everything that is happening, thought that I'll call some few mates. Just sit around and have a bit of a right beyond, bit of a chat, and we want to reflect and do some throwbacks just to make sure that you guys get in with it. Bit of time of catching up with some lads. With me, I have the man who called the Rugby World Cup final, Hanyani Shimamangi. Shimi, I got old Shimo here, yeah. that's the man with that red hat. What's going on, bro? So much, uh, I got some good old uh, fashion quality time. Trying to put some sort of a gym program together. It, uh, hopefully, it, it all works, but yeah. Interesting times we live in. Yeah, very interesting. Junior World Cup winner 2002, Tepo Kokwali. What did you do, Coco? I uh, know, all good. Eh? Just been a bit ill, but I'm um, bouncing back and uh, just enjoying the time at home. The, the, the one Hall of Famer that we have, uh, Tea Time Kennedy Timber. Kennedy, uh, I see you've uh, been yeah. out and about. Uh, how's your vibe? How are you staying um, away from everything, making sure that everything is all good? No, it's all good, Rumi. You know how it is. Uh, well, we're doing what we have to do, but it's been it's been tough though. But catching up on on old some some old music vibes and and jams, just catching up on the KTM music. You you, you guys know what I'm talking about. Still trying to promote the music you used to do back in the '90s. <laughs> for sure, for sure. It's now about to be. This is the time to release it, man. When things when people are knocked down, they're gonna be forced to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we could not do this. We could not do this without the one and only man who can speak seven languages. Rito Shongwane is out there. It's almost coach. Forwards coach. What did you do, brother? Uh, good to see you, fellas. Uh, looking forward to getting the podcast going. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, that's all about it. Uh, uh, let's get down to it. Fellas, Super Rugby, 25 years, the throwback. Anyone can go for it. I mean, which one has been the best format for you? And uh, just elaborate on that. It has to be Super 12. <laughs> yeah. Super 12, that's old when the, the crowds were big. Yeah, the old school. That's when the crowds were in. Uh, it was strength versus strength. Every game felt like a test match, to be honest with you. Probably uh, got a bit too diluted. But Super 12 was definitely my favorite. No, nah, to be honest, I'd also just agree with, uh, with Shimmy there. I think the, the Super 12 was actually the, the best format and we got to see the best rugby. Those tours, <laughs> those tours of Super 12 were, were very long, especially for the South African teams. I mean, how can that be the best format? From my side, I think uh, Super 12 by far the best. Um, you can see that the format and the ways that have changed with the new environment of what's going on in, in current situations, not, not now, but in the past four years, um, you, I don't think the change has adapted to what's going on with social media. There's also all sorts of things. Back then, Super 12, there was a prestige about it. So, you know, you would get when the Sharks play the Bulls, it's only once, you know, once or twice a year. So I think that there's, there's an element of that missing. Now, there's so many matches being played, you know, mm. very, very diluted. That should be said. Richard, what do you think? Because, I mean, do you think there's this way yeah. too much exposure? Because from 1995 after we won the World Cup, everyone was like super rugby, professional rugby, new era, everything's exciting. I mean, there was fireworks, smoke and mirrors and all that. Do you think the audience are just tired of watching that or what's your vibe? Yeah, look, I, I really, I also agree with the gents. It, it has become a bit diluted. Uh, I, I mean, uh, what comes to mind is Super 12, 1996. I think the Reds were leading the table at some stage. The Australian, the three Australian sides were still doing pretty well. Now, you know, there's more teams, uh, so the player base has sort of uh, been stretched a bit. So the quality of the teams, because the players are spread spread across the four teams, it, it's not as good as it used to be. Uh, I guess the same for for South African teams as well. Uh, I remember back then it was just Northern Transvaal, the Sharks, Western Province were still 
Stormers were playing under Western, the name Western Province. It was still quite strong at the time, and I think that's what the fan prepared. I preferred, you know, strength versus strength. It's uh, you look at rugby, and how do you expand it? You know, it's a, it's a trick. Um, how do you get, for example, the improvement in Japanese rugby, um, the Haguaris? How do you get them in the mix? They were finalists last year. You know, there, there is a, a sort of maybe an inclusive. Sometimes having two different leagues, promotion relegation. How much people to watch the other league? You know, that's questionable. Also, it would include everybody. Maybe a development league. But it's also that there is um, a responsibility to grow rugby without diluting the actual super rugby package. So. What kind of new format do you think will sort of bring back the people? Because the whole thing is about bringing back the people. 50,000 people coming to watch a derby game. It, it, it's something that, that got the players going, got everyone going, money was being poured into the game. We, we, how, do you, how do you make a format now that sort of actually lives up to the world? Uh, while Shimmy was, was chatting, um, the way I look at it, if you remember back in the day, it was the top three of the Curry Cup that actually got through to uh, to play Super Rugby. And I think that also, you know, it sort of boosted the Curry Cup because you made sure, you know, everyone rocked up every year. And then the top three went through. The top some of three teams went through and played Super Rugby. And I think we should maybe try to bring that back and, and try to see if the teams, you know, will, will actually rock up and play play in the local in our local fixtures as well. Well, that's that's great. Great. That's going to be a bit tough. Um, so Griffiths I mean, will be playing Curry Cup. Exactly. Yeah. We'll be playing Super Rugby. Considering no, no, no. Western, considering Western Province had all the Springboks uh, out of the Curry Cup side, uh, the Sharks as well. So their teams were a little bit weak. So those two teams, or even uh, the Bulls at times, would easily not qualify to play Super Rugby because they have more box. Do we need so many teams that are in the unions and, and as many as the unions? I mean, you think about it, now it's going to sort of like put a, a big, like a microscope to everyone who is involved in the setup, how the setup is going to sort of survive and make sure there's a whole lot of players who play for smaller unions. I mean, not on a very good paycheck, but they still call themselves professional players and they'll go through and go through this law, hoping one day they can get into that super rugby, get a bit of a super rugby contract. Or should we just make sure that we've got, let's say, four franchises, tighten up the whole thing, make sure that we can now use that as, I'm just putting it out there, use that, those four teams as a teams to sort of like go to Europe for us and, uh, and be the ones who are trying to qualify for the Heineken Cups and all of that. That owner is going to be falling, obviously, on FA Rugby. And I think with their financial constraints as it is, they're going to be, you know, at a nice age that I don't think they want to sort of toy around with those unions because those unions are so worried about their own backs. I mean, if you just look here in Pretoria, they don't, they're don't they not concerned too much about the Griffins or Pumas or anything like that. They're just focusing on survival. So trying to get those people around the table and, and trying to get some sort of um, headway is going to be a tough call. Let's, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Let's take it back to 1996 when the Reds were doing their thing. I mean, uh, memories from back in 96, for me, uh, I, I think about the first time when I saw the Waratahs, I think David Kambizu was still playing in those days, and and having Ben Chun, the youngsters, and all that hype from the 95 World Cup. How was it for you guys, 96, uh, when the, the, the Reds won? I'm trying to remember it. I remember the, the, the Wallabies with the team. Teams back there, remember uh, Ben Chun, you sort of looked at, at, at the Australian team and they had all these good young guys, 19, 20 year olds, absolutely ripping it up. Uh, ben Chun was there, I'm trying to think, was it Daniel Herbert, Jason Little, um, Alton Flat, Lee mm. Latham, you know, the Gregans, Larkhams, uh, George Smith, you know, uh, Owen Finnegan. Uh, that it was a, probably a golden generation for Australian rugby. You know, we're still in school then, so I used to watch these guys and you think, shucks, you know, if these guys can make it at this age, Possibly you can get an opportunity, but uh, they were damn good They're ahead of their time. And one thing they did have is probably tougher forwards than what they've got now, and that that made it a whole lot easier for them to get the results. <laughs> Kenny, how, how, yeah, did you, think, how did you consume it? Because I think you were in England those days, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that was a little golden generation of Australia that was starting to come through, and they would go on and to win the '99 World Cup. I mean, that's when Gregan and, and as Shim said. Finnegan and then started, you know, 
trying to uh, impose this rugby league type style of you know having block runners and, and and having you know some of the ball movement that that they became famous for but i mean just remembering mortlock and those type of youngsters they started getting into the fray because um you know they were sort of speaking that that generation that won the 99 world cup let's say one one player that comes to mind who played both world cups of john eels you know he, he he had been part of that queensland reds team and yeah. he played in the 91 world cup and now uh, lifted the trophy in 99 so he, he was a good experience and, and good forwards at the time I mean, so i think he, he's one of the last dinosaurs of forwards that that really impressed me as a player because any lock or forward that can kick for pole is getting a straight <laughs> kudos from me i mean <laughs> right up there <laughs> no it's whether they're allowed to do it or not he was the last one that was allowed to <laughs> <laughs> no i i surely can't it's, it's, pretty embarrassing when you, it's pretty embarrassing when you're fly off and one of the tight forwards kick for poles <laughs> No, that's you that's that's just, what you call you sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you yeah. call sacrifice. There was some 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 good fullbacks. I mean, Christian Cullen. I remember seeing him at Newlands, and I was like, yes, like this guy. But yeah, Christian Cullen. But earlier, I think before him was the, was the era of Matt Burke, a young Matt Burke. Um, came onto the scene, uh, did everything, the, the complete all rounder, as you'd say, as a as a, as a rugby footballer. Um, and yeah, I think he he sort of set the bar pretty high, and then after that, obviously the the, the era of, of the Christian Cullens. Um, but I still remember my my first favorite uh, rugby player was Hebran Krobler from the from the Bulls. Um, <laughs> and he played fullback for the Bulls, and he and he used to be an all rounder and playing cricket for the Titans or Northern Transvaal back then. So that was my my first hero. But then I remember people like uh, Glenn Osborne. I mean, those are the eras, 96 onwards, of Glenn Osborne's. Um, so those are the people that I sort of looked up to um, and sort of got inspired by um, in, the, in, the, in those sort of days. If, if you go back to the history, Super Rugby was created um, to to excite. If you, if you look at it, when you watched it, it was all about running rugby, opening it up. So you almost, I think, at fullback became one of your most influential players. Yeah. Because we saw the 95 World Cup when Glenn Osborne played and even Andre Hubert. These guys were running the ball back, ball and play, went up, kicking up and just running it back. And then came these generational fullbacks now that weren't scared to have a go. The, the original fullback who didn't play Super Rugby, who carried the ball back, was actually Serge Blanco, if you think about it. Yeah. He was the original yeah. one that used to run it back and play this exciting brand of rugby. But then Glenn Osborne, Andre Hubert, from then on, you know, fullbacks went, uh, it went wild with the guys that ran the ball and they were the sort of the excitement machines. You even go back to, you know, talk about putting bums on seats, it's always fullback. You go to Danzy, Aplon, um, Cheslin, Colby. You, you, you mentioned in Glenn Osborne, eh? it's funny that when you play that old um, the PlayStation game with the Jonah, Jonah Long, Osborne is the only character on that on that game that has a sidestep. So already, I mean, it just shows you how <laughs> how elusive the, the, these guys were. And I, Osborne was uh, was was magic. And um, you know, I also talk about remembering we we used to call obviously the Rolls Royce Andre Hubert. Um, we actually had a move with his name, you know, attached to it. And funny enough, when he, when he started playing, you know, those funny it's, it's funny how you link up the move and the, and the player. But those were classic fullbacks that, that used to run back. But in modern day now, with all the defense and all the, the, the strategies, it's, it's very difficult for, for, for fullbacks to, to do their thing. Yeah? When the Sharks were dominating, and, and, but then there was like the Auckland Blues, especially with, the, with that whole All Black pack. Remember, Zinni, uh, Brooke, uh, they had Olo Brown, they had Sean Fitzpatrick. I mean, but the South African teams were standing up. I mean, Mark Andrews was quite uh, was quite there. I mean, Super Rugby standards in South African rugby was quite good. Do you feel by any time that we've sort of slipped up on that? So, well, you just look at the, the Super Rugby winners, and there's not a lot of South African teams there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty clear and obvious. I think that Sharks team was also a golden generation. Yeah, you know, they had a good feel for each other. They they, they were ahead of their time with Ian Mack. You know, who came with this with this different way of playing rugby even up to this day. Yeah. yeah. You know, you look at the, the Sharks team and how it all operates in, in Durban. So that, that's how it worked. I think more than anything else, where New Zealanders were smart is they went in this whole zonal system, the central contracting, they did it ahead of everyone else. 
If you look at that uh, Blues team, I, I think, you know, just after the World Cup, obviously they had a lot of shame and they, they had some legends that were about to be finish off. So I think it was important that the Blues did well. I mean, Zim Brook, Michael Jones, these are, these are some of the greats that were coming to the end. And I think they were able to, with that whole core of that Blues side, I mean, you remember Edge and Cash, the Cash Meister, and all these players that were together, I think they that run got them together. And that's, I agree with Jim because that shock team, virtually most of them were Springboks. I mean, if you look at it, Adrian Garvey, the, it, was a, it was a packed team. So I think usually when South African teams have done well, they've had a core of the Springboks. And you, you could see the Bulls when they've won it uh, over the years. And obviously Crusaders have done, done that. So I think the national team has an influence on, on, on how the Super Rugby team do. So, talking about the Crusaders, you must remember 96, they were bottom of the log, huh? Who would have thought? If you look at that team again, <laughs> there's some interesting uh, faces that will go on and lift. I mean, Todd Blackadder, you know, Scott Robinson himself. So, but that's a, that was the beauty about Super Rugby back then. You really, you know, teams were hustling each other because you had to play everybody. So, if you slip up, you could find yourself at the bottom of the log and the next year you could win it. I mean, Highlanders were in the final, I think in 98 or whatever, just from the bottom of the log. So it was, uh, I think that format really did work. It's interesting that since 96, the Crusaders have now gone and become the most successful Super Rugby team. You know, you always wonder how they got that right. The Blues had always been the dominant team from New Zealand, but somehow the Crusaders have managed to overtake them and do it consistently for the past couple of years. Yeah, James, uh, just the, the last few words, just to sum it up, because we, we, we are out of time, right? Uh, we have to get back to your lockdowns <laughs> and uh, just get some help. <laughs> um, yeah, just to sum it up, anyone can have a go. Rito, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, this is from 96 to 99, just looking through as we used to go back to Spike. Well, to tell you the truth, what I was thinking about now is that Tepo's background looks so much better today. <laughs> <laughs> the inmates are out. <laughs> yeah, look, Bobs, for me, I, I think around that time, I, I was a big fan of the Australian way of playing. I uh, really enjoyed Matthew Bird, Chris Latham, uh, Motlock when they came through, John Eels was a superstar and then they had the good number eight, I think it was Williams and you know he was quite good, Finnegan, all those guys. So I really enjoyed the Australian sides at the time, the Queensland Reds uh, especially. Yeah. yeah, all right. Yeah, so so my take obviously from the, the, something that I've obviously identified and, and, and sort of looking at modern rugby, just the, the way the flow of the game has changed. If you, if you watch because of all the rule changes, if you, if you just watch some of the lineouts, the scrums, and some of the referee calls, it just it looked a bit more smoother. Um, but because of you know we've tried to get so much clarity, we've ended up getting even more into a mess because it's become even more difficult for for refs to to to, to call these um, these calls. So for me, back then it just looked you know a bit more fluid in, in terms of um, you know getting guys to play. There was so much more running time you can see the ball was in play lots of time lots much more if you look at like uh, Highlanders and whoever it is the, the, the ball could be in play for about two or three minutes with the ball just getting good air time but now it's past three four years like it's, it's a very soft start because they're trying to be so you know pedantic on, on, on these new law changes to sum it up quickly it's innovation you know we'd won the World Cup 95 New Zealand beat us talking about international rugby super rugby Maybe the Sharks were leading the way in 96. The men in black were born. Um, you know, we had the Bob Skinsteads, Flakies, Robbie came. So it was uh, Monty. The Stormers became a statement team. But also don't forget, the Springboks were untouchable when Nick Mallet took over also. You know, we, we were the best team in the world. We played good rugby. So it, it was a, a bit of a change of the guard. You know, 95, we won. 97 or 98, we had this bloody good Springbok team. And then it sort of went a, a little bit pear-shaped after that. But... You know, it was, you, you mentioned it was innovation, it was new, it was new ways of playing rugby, it was challenging and generally the teams that did well were ahead of the curve, the Brumbies, the Auckland Blues, Crusaders were behind, they caught up and now, they, you know, they, they are almost unstoppable now. So it was a bit of old new, but I think the, the smart, the Eddie Joseph, the Rugby Deans, you know, I think Rob McQueen was with the Brumbies back then at uh, Ian Max, 
the next mallet. So those coaches that were sort of ahead of the curve were the ones that sort of uh, survived in, in this new environment of super rugby, international rugby, uh, tri-nations or whatever. I think it was tri-nations back then. Yeah, no, as Shimi said, um, it was really the first time we saw these super athletes. And for me, I remember seeing that and understanding how, how much I had to, had to go. I remember seeing uh, the, the speed that Christian <laughs> Cullen and them were, were, were moving and, and just the raw pace and size of the guys was completely different, you know. And I think that was the big wake-up call for me as well, just to see the guys and the speed of the play was what I remember the most. Um, and the physicality. I think the physicality, I remember, was quite huge for me. Uh, seeing the Jerry Collinses coming up and uh, the, the big old boys, uh, the Michael Jones is finishing off, and uh, the old Ruben Krugers and uh, the Andre Fenters who are still pushing. Um, yeah, those are the, 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 hard, the hard days. Correction, Jerry Collins was in the 2000s, eh? <laughs> this guy. Because you would have been, been playing Super Rugby at 15, eh? I'll tell you, Michael Jones. But Jerry Collins was good. He played Super Rugby at school. Eh? That's how good he was. You still think you're the body runners, the, 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 the Luwakis and all of that, man. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just one thing for us, I thank you so much for your time. Uh, hope you can stay safe. Uh, be kind to yourself. Uh, to everyone. That's the one. Thank you. All right, now we're done, fellas. Thank you so much, you all. Uh,